The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Kia ora. Good morning, everybody. My name is Renee, and I work for the Beyond Myrtle Rust Research Program. Thanks for joining us for our monthly webinar series, bringing you the latest in Myrtle Rust research. Now, we're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. Some of you regular viewers might notice you cannot see my technical slides at this time. This is because we've had a few technical challenges this morning, but right now we are winning. We have Phil. We can see him on screen. You'll be hearing him shortly. We can see his slides, so we're just going to we're just going to quit while we're ahead. Um, therefore, I'm not going to be doing so much of this technical introduction, so hopefully if there's new people with us, you guys are going to be able to figure everything out. So you will see there is a control panel on the side of your screen. It's got an orange arrow button there that collapses it. So if it disappears on you all of a sudden while you're clicking around, you, you can get it back by clicking the orange arrow button. And during the presentation, you can ask questions in the chat panel. Um, you can actually pop that section out if you want to, because it's quite small. So you can ask some questions, I'll check those questions out, and then I'll be able to share them with the audience. Now I'm going to introduce today's speaker, Phil Cannon, although to uh, some people he is a man who needs no introduction. He is a plant pathologist with the USDA Forest Service. He has been working on myrtle rust for many years in the United States and Brazil. And he also has a connection with New Zealand, so it's really nice to host him today in the series. He worked in Rotorua for four years, some time ago though, before myrtle rust had even started to blight our fair land. And he returned to New Zealand to advise on myrtle rust research and management when Osteopax and the Obsidii was first detected here a few years ago. So Phil, are you set there? I'm ready to go. Good, Thank we can you, hear you, so I think you can commence your presentation. Okay, hello everyone. This is kind of a dream come true because uh, about 10 years ago, Mike Wingfield and I wanted to start uh, Myrtle Rust uh, or Oxinia City Eye Club. Um, and we had about 100 members in the club. And with you guys, I think it's you're over 150 in number today, which is fantastic. And so you're automatically invited to join the Myrtle Rust Club. Um, anyway, I'm going to give a talk on um, Ostropoxinia sidii in the Western Hemisphere, and there's three chapters. Here we go with chapter one. Okay, um, this disease was first uh, described as Poxinia guajava because it was found on guava trees um, in Brazil by Winters in 1884. That's what it looks like. Not, it wasn't really a big deal until about 100 years later when the rust became very important in Brazil um, because a rust had started attacking a lot of the eucalypts there. There's about 4 million hectares of uh, eucalyptus in Brazil. You can see them here, quite handsome trees uh, growing very fast. This is a picture I shot. These are about four-year-old trees. They're already being harvested. Um, and they like their trees to grow fast. They don't want them to have um, foliar or, or um, vascular pathogens or anything like that because they can't afford to lose 15 to 50% of their volume growth rates. They can get growth rates of 60 to 90 cubic meters per hectare per year here. They were very worried about diseases uh, hitting some of the plantations. And so they decided to equip some of the universities with a capacity to do good forest pathology work. This is the Universidad Federal de Vesosa, and this is uh, University Federal de Vesosa. Those are the two, two of the universities that got a lot of uh, forest pathology assistance. And one of the big guys doing, he's not so big, but one of the main guys doing all this work was Chuck Hodges, um, and very good tropical forest pathologist. He spent several years down in Brazil uh, trying to get things set up down there. In the path lab. And this is a view, a very modern view. You can see this is where the um, plant pathology lab is in Visosa. There's some greenhouses here, drifts over here. It's actually a huge thing, a big deal. And this is one of the first, um, the first force pathologists, I guess, was Pedro Ferreira. Astolino came along a little bit later, um, but he's been an incredibly productive. Um, instructor there. He's had 
when I visited there, he had 30 grad students at that time, and I think there are about 30 grad students going on for about three decades working there. He works on all kinds of forest plantations diseases, including eucalyptus rust, and he's written uh, several books on these subjects. Um, Brazil started an enormous breeding program to find rust-resistant genotypes of eucalypts and its hybrids um, right from the onset. Uh, Teotonio Cis, uh, I worked with Teotonio some, and he was providing upwards of 5,000 clones per year for Riacel and Clabine and the Euc breeding club uh, co-op, although I don't know how many of those um, clones were tested for uh, resistance to Oxenia sidia. Um, when we're talking about resistance, we're talking the source that is used to test is this UVF2 source of the rust. Okay, and you can see that all of the resistant ones, marked by an R up here, have this gene right here that, that shows that um, they're resistant. So that's, that's of interest. And the, the gene is called PPR1. Um, it may also be of interest to you that uh, Asselino and company did a nice test for, I think it was Ken Old coming over from Australia, that brought over 59, 58 species of Australian South African species, and 39 of those species were eucalyptus. And very interestingly, you guys don't have this, this uh, genotype over there in Australasia yet, but very interestingly, 37 of those species were susceptible. So maybe, maybe there's some other surprises for you guys. This is the area in Brazil it's where uh, the eucalypts are grown, the area in yellow here. By the way, Brazil, this great big place here, is about 10% bigger than Australia. So this is a huge area of land that gets planted. Uh, it also extends down a little bit into Paraguay and Uruguay, right there. And these are the departments in, in Brazil. Uh, and the darker the shade, the more trees. So that altogether, there's about... Um, uh, 4 million hectares of eucalypts that have been planted here. And by the way, Universidad de Vizosa is right about here, right in the middle of it, and uh, Pitocicab is down here. Um, so this covers a big stamp, span. Many people think Brazil is all tropical, but in fact, some southern part of Brazil is almost subtropical. It is subtropical. It gets a lot of frost, all this purple area is vulnerable to frost. So the place where the rust is having, it doesn't like the cold and it doesn't like the extreme drought. So, but this whole area here um, is getting the rust, the area in red here. And this area down here, which is Rio Grande del Sul, does not get it. And I know that for a fact, I, um, I was sent down to buy 30,000 acres of uh, land in this area, and I never saw the rust anywhere there. So as all this is going on, the, uh, the disease is migrating up on the east side of the Andes mountain range, it comes up to Colombia, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and it comes to Florida. By the time it gets to Florida, there are somehow eight strains of the fungus, and one of them is the pandemic. The pandemic does not exist down in Brazil. Interesting, but it's, it's, so the fungus is moving and evolving as it goes. Okay, time to go to the second chapter. So Ostropoxinia uh, makes it to Hawaii in 2004 and things get exciting there too. This is a picture taken by Eloise Kilgore, who was the first person, uh, she and Janice Ushida were the first people to find it in Hawaii. You can see the rest. And so they found it here in Honolulu, and within six months of that find, it was it had spread to every island in the Hawaiian chain and every part. So it, it's a very fast spreading rust. This is what it looks like, uh, this purple color. Um, that, there may have been a filter on that, but anyway, that's all, this is all dead rose apple. Another picture of that. Very fortunately, the disease did not affect the ohia tree. This is an ohia tree, the blossom, and it should look an awful lot like Metrosideros excelsa. 
your calorie tree um, because it's a close relative. It does have some distinct differences, but it's very similar. Um, and this was, a, it was very important for Hawaiians to not get this infected by the rust. Um, it actually does get a little bit infected, but just a little bit. This is a seedling in a nursery. You can see the rust there. For the most part, the ohio was um, resistant. But the big question for Hawaiian res residents was, are there other strains of Ostropoxenia that could be especially pathogenic on ohia? And so again, I went and spent some time with Asalino, uh, Universidad Federal de Sosa, and he gave me one of his best students. I can't say it's his absolute best because um, he has a lot of great students. But he, he gave me the best student, and he also gave him these instructions. Never stop working, never sleep. So this is Rodrigo Grasa Neves. Um, and so the next five minutes of this talk, I'm going to convince I'm, I'm going to condense the next five years of his life into five minutes here. So first thing we did was we went out and we found um, this is a resistant clone. Remember, I showed you how they tested for resistance. And um, uh, so this clone was resistant to the, the uh, source of the rust they're usually using for inoculation. However, this tree, same, same clone, was was getting the rust, but it's a different rust now. It's mutated somehow. We got a new variety. And over the next year, Rodrigo went all through Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and he collected from all of these different hosts, and he collected a total of about 180 um, uh, different isolates. This is what it looks like on on Jabuchicaba. Uh, you can see it on the fruit and on the leaf. This is on the guava tree. You can see the pustules there. And the main thing we did when he was making these collections was you'd put, uh, he tried to get a single pustule and put that in the Eppendorf vial, but sometimes you have to get a cluster like that. Uh, and you take it and you put it in a ice chest, a dry ice chest, immediately, and then put it in 80 degrees uh, below um, centigrade as, as soon as possible, and store it until you can work on the DNA. So now we're going to go into the molecular genetic studies on Ostropoxenia cydia, okay? And so Rodrigo is doing a sandwich program. Now, the I know this is before lunchtime, so I'm trying to get you guys uh, stimulated. Normally, before lunch, you have a uh, for a sandwich, you have a piece of bread, and that, that first piece of bread is the uh, your first year of college in um, university in Brazil. Then you go on, you put the meat and cheese in the sandwich, and then you come back. That would be the studies overseas, and then you come back and get the, the piece of paper saying that you've got a master's or a doctoral degree. Rodriguez sandwich didn't look anything like that. This is what it looked like. Bread on the bottom. Plenty of contents, ham, tomato, cheese, bacon, lettuce, avocado. Um, he had the full, the, the greatest sandwich. And uh, that's because he got help from a lot of people. Here's Rodrigo's name spelled out in full. And here are a lot of the people that collaborated with him. Uh, you guys might know a few of these people. Anyway, making things quick. Um, for the seven different sources, host sources, there was a distinct difference in all of the uh, in the genotypes of the rust that were inhabiting those. Another way of looking at it, uh, two two great groups: the eucalypt and rose apple group on the blue, and the guava over on the right. So the two groups, and if you look at the alleles, you can see that the uh, um, they're they're distinct. These two are the same but they're distinct from these two, which is distinct from this one and this one. Um, so you have molecular differences in the genotypes. And interestingly, when you look at Hawaii, all of the isolates from Hawaii, all of them, and there have been thousands of isolates that have been taken, they've all come out exactly the same. So if you look at a neighbor joining tree, you have 
these sources in Brazil, and then this is a distinct one in Hawaii. So what we wanted to do was see if, um, if some of these other sources of um, Astropoxenia sidii could be pathogenic on the metrosideros. So here's the test that was set up. You got a uh, high concentration uridiniospores of each of those different five different sources, and we're spraying it on the underside of the leaf of the sesep plant. And we've got about a thousand plants that we're inoculating. Um, and uh, 24 hours in the dark, high humidity for a few days. And here is uh, Pedro Andrade, who did all the inoculation work. And 20 days later, this is the kind of results you get. And these are kind of extreme results, but here you get uh, um, a genotype of eucalyptus, excuse me, of metrosideros polymorpha that's very susceptible. And here you get one that's highly resistant. You have the hypersensitive reaction. Okay. So, um, you can see it, and then what we did was use part prop quant, which gives you a, a precise estimate of the percentage of the leaf cover that's affected by the rust. And what we found was that indeed three sources of uh, Astropoxenia rust gave a very high uh, percentage of the leaf covered with the, the pustules, and two others, these are from the uh, guava group, gave low coverage. So in fact there are more pathogenic um, uh, genotypes to, to be wary of. Um, and on the basis of this, Hawaii suspended restriction of, or it put in restricting order to keep mertaceous plants out of Hawaii, keep them from coming in. Okay, now the last chapter. So, Climate change can be a game changer for Astropoxenia sidia. So a lot of you think that Hawaii is a pleasant place with beaches and uh, girls in bikinis and stuff like that, and it's true, it's pretty nice. However, uh, it's also a very rugged uh, terrain. The highest mountain in the world is Mauna Kea on the island of Hawaii, and the topography in lots and lots of Hawaii tends to be very steep and rugged. You need front point crampons to get up these ridges. So the, the way that uh, surveys are done is by flying. And you can see the flight line along this ridge top here and pictures were taken all along that way. And here's a couple of pictures. You can see ohia trees uh, dying out here, or at least using all their foliage. Another picture. Here's a close up. and taking samples. When you take samples, uh, a lot of the leaves are missing, but on the ones that are remaining, especially on the apicormic shoots, you find these uh, small pustules sticking around. And um, there's another site, majestic uh, countryside, but very sad to see the, the um, ohia going out. One thing we did notice was that the, uh, the hairy leaved, um, varieties of uh, ohia were much less susceptible to the rust. So this is in a very wet area of, uh, of Hawaii. And in fact, um, that site that I just showed you got 126 centimeters of rainfall in the 24 hour period, which is, um, that's more rainfall than falls in 55% of uh, the the nations on the on planet Earth in an entire year. So uh, it can get very wet there. And here you can see the situation. That This is where all those, those pictures were taken, right along this ridge line. And we expect that it's going to get even worse because there's a lot more heat getting stored in the ocean. Uh, temperatures are going up. A uh, lot, lot, lot uh, rougher weather out there, so there's a lot more rainfall. And if uh, climate models are correct. Um, in some places like Brazil, we can expect uh, a five to seven degree increase in Celsius. So we can expect the range of, of um, the Astropoxenia rust to go further south 
in here. And so it might go all the way down into Uruguay and Paraguay. Okay. And what will this do in the case of New Zealand? Last time I was in New Zealand, I was pre predicting up in Raoul Island, all the uh, Myrtaceous species up there would get hammered by the rust. And they could also get hit in this light yellow area here. But I, I thought this, this area would be too frosty or too cold for it. However, if you have uh, climate change going on, maybe this area will warm up and become susceptible too. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, thank you, you've been a very quiet audience, um, but I'd be glad to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Phil, for that excellent talk. Yes, it is a bit of a strange experience in here doing these webinars because, of course, we cannot see or hear anybody else. And at the moment, the question box is very quiet. So hopefully this isn't about more technical gremlins um, haunting people. But I'll ask you a couple of my own. Oh, wait. Here we go. Someone's kicking it off here. You mentioned, maybe if I, if I share this with the audience. Okay. I mean, much fun either. Here we go. Now you might be able to see that, Phil, but I'll read it out anyway. Right, you mentioned a gene PPR2. SP, that was correlating with resistance. Has anyone conducted more genome-wide studies on resistance, and are there any insights into the mechanisms of resistance? Uh, in, in the eucalypts, I'm absolutely sure there's been 50 studies on that. Um, I think Ostolino's in the audience. He could probably uh, answer that better than I can. Um, but I don't know if you have a way of contacting him. Anyway, uh, the answer is definitely yes, but I can't, um, I, I, I can't tell you the results of that. Um, yeah, and if people do want to get in touch with myself or Phil, I hope that would be relatively straightforward. Um, you will have my email address via the invite, and I'm certainly happy to connect people. So let's have a look okay. at the next question. Um, again, thanks for that great presentation. Are you aware of any monitoring activities for Myrtle Rust in Hawaii taking place now? Um, and yeah, those were some of my questions too. I mean, do, do we know what's happening now? We obviously had a big defoliation event, trees died. Um, are things growing back? Are they doing better now it's drying or drier, back to normal? Um, are people noticing changes in murder rust severity on Ohio trees? I mean, there's a lot wrapped up there. So perhaps you can just yeah. give us the lowdown yeah. on what's going on that you know about. Yes, for sure. Uh, yes, there's monitoring going on. We have about five people that are pretty good at, at monitoring. We, we're, we're flying the area every year um, and, and marking down where there's new ones. Uh, Will Weaver, who would appeared in one of those slides, was uh, one of the guys that regularly flies and take pictures of that. Um, and then the pathologists uh, at the universities are going out and and, uh, at, and the US Forest Service are going out and checking um, uh, places where there are new finds. Um, and so uh, there's also been a few surprises, like the island of Molokai had a, a wipeout of some Mertaceous species. And so there, there's, there's other, it was a rose apple in that case, but so there's some new surprises coming on. Um, so it, it's it's not static. It hasn't it hasn't stopped, but it's sort of quiescent. It used to be when you were out on the islands when it was first there, you could shake a tree and a, a cloud of orange spores would come off that tree and just float off into the atmosphere, slowly float off. And when you finished working on this disease, you'd come home or back to the hotel and you'd be orange all over. Have to take a shower for about. 50 minutes to get all the spores off you. Um, the amount of inoculum out there is way, way less now because the trees in the most vulnerable um, positions uh, have already died. But it's, it's all the same. It's been very limited. It's only been in the, mo in the wettest places, and there are some very wet places where we're getting a large amount of mortality of Ohia. There are other species of Mertaceae that 39 of the 84 species of Mertaceae in Hawaii have been found to be susceptible, and some of them uh, are on the verge of extinction. Yeah. Did you so? Did you see other species aside from that ohia get hit for the first time in that very wet year? Oh yeah, 
so I, I, you, you could go to other islands and see others, other species just um, folding up that hadn't been affected by the first onslaught. So okay. that's going on. All right. Now the questions are definitely getting going now, so we'll, we'll keep cracking on. Um, in relation to that, was the change in behaviour in Hawaii related to the introduction of a new strain? I think you've already mentioned the weather. Um, was any work done to look at whether there was some genetic change in the pathogen as well? You know, um, I wish I could answer that really well. I think, the, like I said, the, the, the uh, fungus has migrated a whole, a whole lot. So one of the things that we could never do was compare the actual source of the uh, the uh, pandemic strain of the rust with the eucalypt strain in Hawaii, we can't do that except in a in a controlled chamber, and those things are expensive. We 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 do have access to that, we just haven't done it. Um, so there's there's some uh, some limitations there in terms of of uh, how much work we've done on that. All right, now you definitely have some fans down here in New Zealand. We've got great to see your handsome face. Uh, and indeed, you are quite a handsome chap. <laughs> you certainly got it. I'm, look, I'm looking at a map of New Zealand right now. That's what I see. So, oh, well, yeah. you've, you've certainly got the sense of humour we all enjoy down here in New Zealand. Um, thank you for the PowerPoint. Do you see any real opportunity for endophytes to help us create resistance to myrtle rust? There's certainly a big body of that kind of work going on in our program. And... I guess people very keen to to look for hope or solutions somewhere. Uh, more power to them. I I really don't know much about that. Okay. Um, it sounds sounds cool to try. Yeah. All right. There do not appear to be much biosanitation protocols in the field in Hawaii. Is that normal? I think if you've got vast amounts of spores blowing around everywhere anyway, um, one could argue you're almost up against an impossible task, but. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, if you come to Hawaii, um, we had a we would take you out to the fiercest breaker that we could find, and we'd, we'd make you go from the field into the fierce breaker. That's a, in the ocean, right? So this is a body a body whomping place where you you go out and you ride the wave, and you go out there for a half hour. If you stay out a half hour with all your clothes on and your boots <laughs> on, then then you're clear to the spores okay um so it's typically when you're way. when you're moving around in hawaii you don't worry about it at all because we all, we know the spores are already everywhere okay but uh particularly when like a visitor comes and things like that we're we're we try to be very careful to uh, not let them take the um, spores back with them for sure. Now, uh, we were going to hear about the eucalyptus uh, resistance breeding and the collapse of that today. I guess you decided you were just going to run out of time. Um, and perhaps we'll hear from you about that in another webinar later. Um, but some someone has asked, are you aware of breeding programs to develop resistant plant varieties in the US or elsewhere? Um, well, I mean, the, the program in Brazil has got to be bigger than... Uh, any other disease breeding program I've ever heard of. I mean, it's the, the areas that they have with plants in raised nursery beds um, where they're testing would cover a whole hectare of, if, if you can imagine that. It's, it's, it's uh, millions and millions of plants that they're, they're testing because you have to test about six or seven uh, plantlets of each clone in order to uh, get a read on that. And so that's um, still going on? Oh yeah, that's still going on. Uh, like I say, Asalino could uh, tell you more about that, and I'm sure they've had to adjust because they had the new, the new strain uh, of of uh, rust. It's also very effective. Come in, so they have to breed for that too. They also have to breed for resistance to a ceratocystis. It's a, a huge problem down there. So yeah, there's a huge amount of of, of breeding for uh, of eucalypts for for resistance there. Yeah. We're definitely going to have to see if we can line up a talk on that sometime. Uh, next question, do you think the increase in impact in Hawaii is also due to increasing inoculum load as, as well as climate and has any work been done to remove rose apple as a source of inoculum? Yes. Um, one of the, the first recommendation I had when I was over there was uh, 
around all the nurseries, take out all the rose apple within about uh, 200 uh, or 300 meters of the, of the nursery. And that, that had a, a huge impact. It, it really uh, cut way down on the amount of uh, rust, excuse me, um, fungicides that they had to use to control the rust. So that's, that's uh, one thing that's been done. Um, I think that answers that. Very good. Is the UVF2 what is commonly referred to as eucalyptus rust? Yes, right. that's uh, that's Asselino's, uh favorite inoculum. He's been using it for um, I think about twenty years. Oh goodness! Well, I may, I might I'm a little bird Asselino himself. In fact, might have just told me he's retired. <laughs> Um, and so some uh, arm twisting might have to be done to get him to do another talk, but perhaps we can hunt down one of his protégés. He obviously has very, very many of them. Yep. Um, That'd be the way to go. That's right. That's right. All right. How much genetic diversity of Ape City I do you think exists in Brazil, or does variation seem to flourish when it reaches new environments? Do you think well, you know, when I went down there, Asselino seemed to think that there was uh, just one source of rust that mattered, and that was the UVF2 that he was working with. Um, and I said, well, we need to look at these other sources because we're looking at a, a different host plant. We're not looking at eucalypts. We're looking at metrosideros. Um, and, and so uh, what Rodrigo found with his study, uh, 140 different isolates, was there, there was a huge amount of variability in, in the rust. Um, and uh, so probably every single host that there is, um, or group, uh, genus of hosts anyway, is going to uh, sponsor, going to favor the development of a certain uh, genotype that does especially well on it. Okay. But I think there's a lot of variety. Does the distribution of this rust and rapid ohia death um, overlap on Hawaii, perhaps? You want to mention rapid ohia death briefly, Phil, for people who might not be aware of that sure, scourge. Sure. Yeah, it's a retail I, source. I'm waiting for a chance to, to bring that up. Uh, here I, we go. I didn't want to be, because you only give me 30 minutes to talk. Oh, no, it's rough. So, it's rough. so but um, one of the reasons that we've sort of backed off on um, working on this rust as much as we used to is because we have another pathogen in Hawaii, uh, which is Ceratocystis leucohea which is hammering, absolutely hammering the uh, uh, ohia tree. It's killed over a million so far. It's a vascular wilt. Um, it's very, very uh, aggressive when it gets going. It needs, it needs some wounds to get going and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's rough weather over in Hawaii. You get a lot of breakage of the stems and stuff like that. Um, the fungus can get going. Um, so yeah, those, those two, uh, uh, species of fungi are competing uh, to for, for the ohia source, but the rust tends to get younger trees. The ceratocystis tends to get the older um, uh, um, ohia trees. Fantastic! It's really not much to say about that. Um, it's just terrible. So, though, I wonder if the um, Asker of the question meant geographically. Do they does the uh, rapid ohia death respond to similar environmental cues in terms of warm and wet, or does it operate quite differently in terms of its environmental response as well? Ah, uh, well, um, comparing ceratocystis with uh, the Ostropoxenia. Ostropoxenia flourishes when the humidity is high, when there's really really heavy rainfall i mean if you go you get unbelievable downpours there and if the downpour continues over like a two-week period that's enough for the um you know the ostropoxin is a monocyclic rust for 99.99 percent of its actions so it only requires like 14 days before you get a turnaround and from one pustule the spores in one pustule they infect another leaf there's another pustule forming there and within 14 days, and another 44 spores available for infecting. So the very quick turnaround in the case of, of that. For the ceratocystis, what you really need is some violent storms. 
And, and, and they, what they have to do is they have to break the limbs, crack them, um, rip stuff off, and create wounds. And then uh, the serratocystis, uh, which is coming mainly in the form of allurial um, conidia in the frass of uh, beetles, is, is landing there and it's able to germinate and colonize and it grows super rapidly through, we've, we've seen the, um, when we do artificial infections, we see the, the disease spread um, 10 meters in a month in the vascular tissue. So they're very different fungi, they're doing very different things. I see, all right, there's just a couple left now and it seems to have gone quiet. I can see a few people are uh, heading off back to perhaps their next meetings or back to their normal day jobs. So we'll just get a couple more in here and then I think we'll be done. How can land managers utilize resistant Metrosideros polymorpha varieties on a landscape level? Well, uh, there are quite a few studies. Um, uh, well, with, with Metrosideros for the Ostropoxenia, Right. I guess so. Okay, Maybe so I would think you I mean, just plant them. We're we're not we're not even breeding for resistance to Ostropoxenia. We are breeding for resistance to uh, the Ceratocystis in in Hawaii. Um, so and uh, so the answer to the first question is I'm not sure because we're not doing that. Um, the answer to the second question is. Um, uh, if it was for ceratocystis, um, then it would just be in some limited areas where you could you could replant. Um, I, I'll leave that question. Yeah, that's kind of curly. Um, well, arguably, so is this one. Do you know how long the different strains took to evolve and what selective pressure may have driven this? Uh, we're talking about Ostropoxenia. No, I have no idea because mm -hmm. the 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 uh, naturally evolved there the the rust did not exist in 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 Brazil um, the the virulent strains did not exist not in great numbers at, at least until the eucalypts was brought were brought over so eucalypts were brought over from from Australia um, and they hadn't faced the rust before so basically. There, there has been no natural evolution towards resistance, it's just a um, very short period. Right. So you, you have to test, they have to be resistant to something else that um, will also confer some resistance for the rest. Okay, I think this is more of a comment. Someone else has snuck in here at the last minute, but I'll read it out in response to the earlier question. Genome-wide studies the Ape City I, which have been performed, include Eucalyptus grandis and more recently Eucalyptus globulus and Carimbia by QTL analysis and genome wide association study in Eobliqua. These point to many, many loci influencing susceptibility in eucalypt. And fortunately, I think that's what we're seeing down here as well in our early studies of Manuka. Yeah, okay, that's, those are some dudes over in uh, Australia that are reporting. That is, that is, it's funny, you know, I've decided... Good, good, on, good on him for doing that. Um, I might stop keeping things anonymous because it does all feel a bit odd, to be honest. Um, and I was watching another webinar the other day where people were letting people know who was asking what questions. So I'll let everyone know it's Jules. Jules Freeman is indeed in Australia and the person who's providing us that comment today. Thank you, Jules. Yes, mate, very good. All right, that's it. We have had another comment um, from somebody who says, surf's up here, so I have to run. <laughs> and that uh, I think applies to a few of our audience who have dropped off the attendee count. So I'll wrap it up there. Um, there's obviously been great attendance here at your talk today, Phil, and a lot of interaction there with the questions. So you have such a wealth of knowledge. We may well hear from you again in the webinar series. Um, and I'll think about whether we might broaden things a little bit next year, um, perhaps to bring in some of these newer plant pathogens as well. Keep people tuned in to the threats that are still offshore, but that we might have to entangle with one day. 
So a video of today's webinar and answers to questions. Actually, we don't need answers to questions because we answered them all. I decided it's less work for me to just let these webinars keep running and get the questions done in real time. So we'll probably stick with that too. But you will see this webinar and the uh, recording of our question and answer chat here. Um, being made available to you, you'll get a link in your inbox in about two days' time, and we also have all the videos on the Beyond Myrtle Rust website. Then uh, the next webinar is going to be Wednesday, August 4th, a little bit earlier than I usually do in the month, but I'm going to be away the week after. So on Wednesday, August 4th, we're going to be hearing from Rowanne Sutherland. She is a researcher working at Scion in Rotorua. She's been undertaking surveillance and monitoring of Myrtle Rust in New Zealand for several years, but her work now stretches beyond that. For example, she is starting to look at the impacts of myrtle rust on Lophomyrtus reproduction as well. Her kind agreement to give the next webinar has only recently been obtained by myself, so I don't have her talk title yet. She's still thinking through what exactly she's going to focus on. But when you get that invite landing in your inbox in a couple of weeks, it's going to tell you all about it. So thanks a lot for coming along again, everyone, today. Ka kite. See you next time.